Juan, uh, Daphna, Lucia, and Mike, and particularly Leon and Juan, who initiated this whole wonderful, wonderful experience for five months, was fantastic discussions and arguments. I want to thank Gal for the organization and the Israeli Institute for Advanced Studies. And uh, what I would like to do today is discuss uh, principles that link. Uh, wait a minute that link um, a neuronal activity in the human brain to the conscious emergence of an uh, image of, of a face. But my ambition is, of course, I use faces because they're a very convenient set of images and, they're very very and we are very good at, at seeing them. But I hope that the principles that I will highlight here could be extended to other visual images, and perhaps with some elaboration also to other sensory modalities. And I'll uh, be talking mainly about the method of intracranial recording. You heard it uh, often in this talk, where because of uh, through clinical diagnostic procedures, a neurosurgeon places contacts, many, many contacts, all over the cerebral cortex. Of course, these are guided <coughs> strictly by clinical uh, demands for finding epileptic foci, but this allows us direct recording from groups of neurons from the cortex and sometimes from inside the cortex. And I'll be talking about mainly the visual hierarchy, visual areas. Uh, I'll bring some examples from early visual cortex, but I'll focus mainly on these high order areas in the visual hierarchy that Victor already mentioned that are representing face selective, there are face selective neurons there. Uh, and that will be sort of the basis of uh, the principles I'd like to, to discuss. <coughs> and I'll structure my talk as a series of principles and questions in which I'll try to highlight certain principles that come out from our own experimental work with intracranial recording. And the first question is w the very basic one. What is the neuronal dy dynamics that is associated with a conscious visual image, with the appearance for example, of a face image in our conscious, mi conscious mind. And here I will want just to uh, refer to this method that was mentioned a lot, backward masking. You're presenting a target, for example, a face stimulus for a very brief period of time, about 16 milliseconds, followed by a mask. And the nice thing about this uh, method, it allows you to titrate very carefully the, um, the ability of subject to see the target or not. You can titrate the, d the distance between the target and the mask such that with very little change or almost no change in the physical properties of the stimulus, sometimes the, the subject will see, the patient in this case that we are recording intracranially, will see the face and sometimes they will not. And not also, not also another advantage, it, uh, it limits the time of the exposure very, very precisely. So you know exactly for how long the image was presented because then the, the stimulus, at least on the retina, is quenched by the, the, by the mass, so we have here a very temporally precise stimulation. And when you are recording these high order areas, specifically contacts that are face selective, in other words, they respond only to the faces, they don't respond to the mask, and you look what happens when the subject, the patient report that they saw the face image versus cases where they report that they saw only the mask, they didn't see the face image. You see two major phenomena, and we saw them in many, many experiments. And that are one is signal amplification. The signal nonlinearly, just like Stan described very nicely, is amplified um, uh, to, to a large degree compared to non-seeing non uh, non the, the face uh, condition. But another, I think even more interesting phenomena, is that despite the fact that the stimulus is for a fraction of about 20 milliseconds, look at the response. The response lasts for hundreds of milliseconds after the stimulus was already quenched by the mask on the retina. So we have here two phenomena, amplification and extended or sustained responses, and we <laughs> hypothesize that this is actually a, 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 a sort of dynamic that is reminiscent to the one that Stan would talk about when he talked about global ignition. In other words, when, where you have positive feedback interaction in between neurons, and we think these are based on this lateral connection that Victor showed so nicely, that activate each other, and they do two things. This positive feedback activation is amplifying the signal, so it crosses a high threshold of activity, but not less importantly, it keeps signal, the signal alive despite the fact that the, the, the drive 
from the retina is quenched. So the, the, this reverber reverberatory activity keeps on the signals for hundreds of milliseconds. And we, will, we propose that this ignition, and this, by the way, is a local ignition, not in the sense that it's only among few neurons in a very <coughs> localized space, but it is localized to a particular <coughs> visual area. So in this case, it would be, let's say, the face representation in high order areas. So this local uh, um, amplification is actually a major player in conscious perception. So whenever you have this local ignition, you are aware of the signal, and if, and if you don't have it, then you, you lose the awareness. Now, more recent studies, Leon, for example, led a very nice study on that, co cause us to think that, the, to realize that the situation is more elaborate. And the, re the result is very, very simple, but very, very powerful. If you now continue the stimulus, instead of showing it for very brief time and getting the ignition, you just continuously show the signal, the stimulus for about one and a half second, okay? So you show the face for one and a half second. This is data collected by Itzhak Norman in our, uh, Norman in our lab. What ignition dies down to a la large degree by about almost 80% or 70% of its full ampli uh, amplification. So the huge reduction or adaptation of the amplitude of the signal, despite the fact that I will argue that there is not much change in the perceptual appearance of the image. So we have to somehow explain this major change in activity that happens with extended periods. So the ignition sort of dies down. Importantly, there is still a difference between preferred and non-preferred stimuli. So there might be some information here that is allowing the signal to continue to live in our uh, <coughs> conscious experience, but we have to sort of understand that the ignition is just the beginning of the process and there is adaptation. And the sustain of the stability of the visual image that we see cannot be delegated to the frontal cortex because it's it looked at frontal electrode, you see some activation there, but the ignition is just the same. You see that after extending the stimulus, the response dies down, uh, despite the fact that, uh, as far as, uh, as we experience, the, the face image remains pretty stable along one and a half seconds that we show it. So um, the, the sort of principle that I would like to propose is that face perception is asso associated with an amplified and persistent 200 to 400 millisecond ignition-like dynamics that is localized to face selective visual areas. However, the du ignition duration is fixed and is not related to the duration of the stimulus and is dissociated from the of the visual stimulation. And it appears that perception is initiated by the ignition, but is sustained by something else, maybe by this tail or maybe some silent synapses that we are not, uh, don't know about or many other possibilities. But this <coughs> is an interesting further uh, issue to, to study. Now, I want to dive in and ask a more specific question. Okay, we talked about a face emerging in, con in consciousness, but I would like to ask, what defines the specific appearance of this face? What defines the content of the image? Why this face looks the way it looks like? What is the neural processes that define the appearance of this face as this image that you are seeing right now? And this is a study that was done by Shani Grossman in our lab and Ido Davidesco. The experiment is very, very simple. It's a one-back visual task. Uh, the patients look at images of different faces or different images of faces, also other categories. Uh, when, and they're fixating, they're presented for 250 milliseconds. If the images keep changing, the, the patient does not have to do anything, just look at the images. But w if an image repeats, then the patient has to press a button whenever the image repeats. So it's a very simple one-back visual task. And what Shani did, she looked at many, many electrodes, many, many patients, and selected only the electrodes that are face selective. In other words, they respond selectively to faces and no other category. You see that this is the location of electrode. I'll show this format of the flattened cortex because it's very convenient. You see the visual system here. These are high-order visual areas. This is the frontal cortex. And as you can see, as predicted, ventral stream, high-order areas, are all populated by these face selective contacts that respond to, to faces. But interestingly, if you look now, you collect all the face selective contacts, and here Shani, for convenience, ar arrange them in a descending order of activation. If you look how these 
uh, electrodes are activated by, for example, this phase that you see here, you see that not electrodes respond uh, equally. There are some electrodes that respond very strongly to this phase, while other electrodes show a much reduced reduction. So there is a profile associated with the appearance of this phase. This by itself might not be very interesting, but for the same contacts, exactly the same contacts, you look at the response to this phase of Merlin Monroe, you see now you could get a completely different profile. It's as if each phase is associated with a unique barcode or pattern of activation in the phase areas that sort of are linked directly to the appearance of this phase. And sometimes a pair of phases will have very, very different patterns. When the patterns are very different or very uncorrelated, we say there is a long distance between these two patterns. This refers to Hyatt's uh, presentation of the shape space, but I'll use the, 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 the term of distance between these patterns, whether these patterns are similar or not. And the interesting thing is, if you look at pairs of faces, you see that some pairs of faces have very similar profiles of activations, while other pairs of faces have very different, so this will have long distance between patterns in th of this pair, and this pair has short distance of uh, patterns of activation. Now you can now take all the possible pairs that the patient saw and design and build a distance matrix, just like you have a distance map of cities in Israel, how far they are from each other. So you can look at different faces, and if, for example, uh, you look at this pair, they are very different than each other, they are very long distance, the activation pattern is very different, but if you look at this pair, you see that they are very short distance, the activation pattern will be very similar. Now, why is all this di interesting? You say, okay, what's the point? I'm just measuring distances. I want to sort of extend on a theory, I think the fascinating idea that Shimon Edelman and Kalanit Grispect or many years ago proposed, and the idea is that these distances are not just some kind of arbitrary behavior of the brain, but they actually define how things look like. And the idea is the following. What really defines how this picture looks, looks to you, appears to you, is not the specific barcode, the pattern of activation of this image in the cortex, but what's more important is how, this, how similar this pattern is to other patterns produced by other images. So the appearance of this phase will be determined by the fact that each pattern is close to this phase, which is uh, uh, more similar to it, but very, very different from this pattern and very different from this pattern, but a little bit intermediate close to this pattern of the clock. So by all these distances, you are sort of triangulating and defining what is the appearance of this phase based on not its specific pattern, but its similar distances or geometric location in shape space, to use another terminology, um, uh, relative to all other possible visual images that can exist in this visual cortex. So how can we test experimentally whether this notion of distances has any validity? Maybe it's just some kind of artifact of development that they, uh, they emerge. Shani had this idea that if these distances, that this distance matrix that I, I was talking about is important for face perception, maybe face recognition, then it, it makes sense that other systems that have the, the, they have the ability to do the same kind of visual processing like face recognition, although they are completely artificial, very different, developed in a very different way, should be employing the same strategy of using the same distances as the neural uh, face selective areas are. And of course, Chaim described very nicely this revolution in what's called deep convolutional networks. I'm sure you all know about them. These are networks that are sort of inspired by the visual hierarchy. They are made up of, of layers of increasing complexity. So first layers look like a little bit like V1 responses. Top layers are doing actually a, a labeling of identity or, or category. And in between you have intermediate layers and each layer is consisting of artificial neurons that are activated by the image that you are producing. So we thought uh, to do something very simple. Maybe just take the distance matrix generated in the human brain take the same images that the patient saw, feed them into this deep convolutional network, and for every layer of the network, you can, I, you can uh, now ask, is the pattern of artificial neuron activation for this phase similar or dissimilar to that phase, and just take the entire distance matrix, uh, 
of the artificial network at each and every layer of the network and ask to what extent it is similar to the human brain. Okay, this is the idea. It has two val valuable aspects. One, that it shows that this has some functional significance if we find such correlation. But more than that, but finding which, by finding which layer in the artificial network is actually expressing the correlation, we might get some insight into what is the function of these high order phase selective areas. So Shanit did this correlation together with Guy Gazir from the computer department, and the result was very striking. You find a set of layers that show very high and very significant correlation between the human brain and the artificial network. These are the different layers of this network that does face recognition at a performance better than humans, and not the two things. First of all, we have the high correlation, so the network is using the same distant metrics that the human brain is using, but the correlation is not at the lower level layers, which represent the local features of the phases, and they are not at the identity level. They are dealing with the sort of more pictorial aspect of the image. In other words, not who the person in the picture is, but how this picture appears to you uh, in terms of its pictorial or appearance uh, properties. Another uh, prediction, very simple and straightforward prediction of this idea of distances, that if you have two faces that look very similar to each other, this, by the way, is not Barack Obama, is Barack Obama look-alike, and they, he, of course, looks very similar to Barack Obama and looks on many, many levels very different than this uh, image, you will uh, make a very simple prediction that the pattern distance between the activation by this face and this face in the face selective area will be close, and the distance between this will be very far. And this was precisely what Ido Davidesco tested. It actually tested it not on the patient themselves, but in, on students at the Weizmann Institute. We put simply all the face images on little cards, and we asked the students at the Weizmann Institute to place the cards near each other if the two faces looked at them similar, so the geometric distance between these images were close, or to place these cards very far from each other if the images looked very far to them. So here you see, this is the, the geometric distance that the student plays the different pairs of images. And as you can see, and as I said, this is a short distance, this is a long distance, so we have this perceptual distance axis. And then all you need to do is take the same activation pairs in the patients in Long Island, and ask, is there a correlation between the pattern of activation in the brain in the United States and the perceptual similarity in Israel? And you see a significant correlation that actually improves uh, substantially if you rely only on a very reliable electrode, the one that showed less noise, you see that the correlation even improves. And if you would think that this correlation is because of low-level features, this is not the case, because if you do exactly the same analysis on early visual areas, you find that there is no correlation. So the second principle I would like to propose is that the appearance of a conscious visual image is, is defined not by its specific pattern, but by the relationship between the pattern and all other possible visual activation patterns, and this is what gives it the appearance the way it looks like. The third question I would like to address is our, it's related to Victor Lama's uh, talk, are we aware of the neuronal activation in early visual cortex? In other words, does visual cortex perform as a conduit of information leading to, for example, the face areas in the case of face uh, uh, recognition, or is it actually a participant, or are we uh, in some way sensitive to what's happening in early visual cortex? And the way we wanted to study it, it, it was done with the Tal Golan, uh, Lucia was actually also a collaborator on this, in this project, and we wanted to use a very powerful and very common, and this is following Liad's uh, ecological philosophy, a uh, very ecological visual illusion, and this is spontaneous blinks. Now, why spontaneous blinks are very powerful and very relevant to early visual cortex? Because every few seconds, you block completely all the information that comes from the visual world into your retina, and you are totally unaware of this blockage. If I challenge you, if you knew or even noticed that you were blinking about every five seconds during the last um, hour or so, you will probably will not even know that you are doing it, but in fact, you are blocking your visual field, so from the point of view of your retina, the room darkened for about every five seconds. And you know, you might say, 
okay, blinking is so fast that, you know, you just don't see it, even if, if there will be uh, such a break. So Tal actually made this nice simulation where he tied the luminance of this video to the actual blinking. He measured very carefully, very high-speed camera, the blinking of a, of a subject. And I want to illustrate to you that you can see very vividly uh, gaps in the visual uh, stimulation when they are done uh, externally, not through your own spontaneous blinking. So what you'll see is a tying of the blinks with the, with the image, and I think clearly, I mean, if you don't see it, you should consult with Mike Shadlan, uh, who is a neurologist. <laughs> um, but you clearly see that these uh, blinks should be visible if they are produced from outside. So the experiment is obvious. I'll not get into many details. Basically, we simulated blinks by blocking the visual stimulation from outside, and you compare them in different parts of the visual hier hierarchy with the real spontaneous blink that we measured with, uh, with eye trackers. So I want to show you an example first from early visual cortex. And this is the response that you see for the artificial blink, we call it gap, where we actually blocked uh, externally the visual stimulation. And you see that in early visual cortex, there is a very powerful response to the onset of the blink, very powerful response to the offset of the blink. So uh, clearly visual uh, not blink, the, or the gap uh, 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 that is externally induced that you see. So clearly visual, uh, early visual cortex, as expected, is responding to the gap. But this is not the interesting question. The interesting question is whether when you are spontaneously blinking, so the retina gets the blockage but you don't see, will early visual cortex show any sign of this uh, of this uh, fact that you are completely blind to this interruption. And you see that V1 is activated even a bit stronger to the spontaneous blink. So there is a massive activation in visual cortex, early visual cortex, that you are completely oblivious to, to it when it's done by, through spontaneous blink. The picture completely changes if you go to high order face selective areas. There you don't see any response whatsoever when spontaneous blinks are happening, exactly what's expected if this area is reflecting conscious experience. And you do see some activation when you have externally induced blink that you see. And interestingly, the activation is not for the disappearance of the stimulus, but the reappearance of the face image after the gap is over. So we see a nice dissociation between early visual cortex that seems to follow uh, the actual physical stimulation of the retina in high order face selective areas that seem to be following the perceptual experience of the, of the subject. <coughs> and the, the last question I would like to address is where does the activation flows following the ignition? This was debated here versus the global workspace and very elegant suggestion of Stan de Haan and, and, and the counter argument. So the answer to this question is actually <coughs> complicated. And I want to show in what sense it's complicated. So first of all, I want to go back to this one back visual uh, experiment I reported. And in fact, if you think about it, it's a sort of no report versus report paradigm. Because whenever the faces are changing, then, uh, then the, 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 the patients are asked to just stare at them, just look at them, not do anything. So they're just experiencing them without any uh, report. But whenever an image repeats, then the patient is asked, to report. In other words, not only see the image, but add the button press following the report. So I would like to show you a movie prepared by Niv Noy. This study was done by Niv Noy, where I will show you uh, three pictures. Two will be uh, different. So the, 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 the patient, you remember, will be just watching the, the pictures. We slow down the movie dramatically so you'll be able to, to attend to the, the different activation. What do you see here? is a massive collection of many, many experiments like that on the cortical surface. This, I remind you, is the visual cortex. This is the frontal cortex. And what I want to show you, and notice that every, these are all contacts all over the cortex. And whenever a contact will be activated, it will turn into red, OK? So I want you to watch what happens when two different faces appear. And the third face will be a repeat, so it will be not only uh, f looking, but also uh, also reporting, and I want you to notice if there is how the the <laughs> frontal cortex also uh, responds to these repeats. So let's see if it works. Okay, you are starting when it will come to 
Yeah, here is the face. And notice immediately this massive and very nice activation. By the way, notice how it persists long after the image was gone, because these are only 250 stimulation. Again, there will be another face. This time, different face, so the subject is just watching the images. So you see massive activation in early visual contact. A little bit of activation in front of, as that was discussed here. But notice now there will be the same repeat uh, stimulus, but this time the subject, the patient is asked to press a button. And notice, particularly here, how the, the frontal cortex is, <coughs> is massively activated. You see now the activation persists in much longer, and of course it continues and becomes even more spread with the, with the button press. And basically when you do a summary analysis of this phenomena, and I color the, the electrode contacts that were associated with the report, not only just with seeing, versus the one that were indifferent to the report, they were just responding to the seeing, you see very nicely the main activations that are related to the report were in the frontal, while in the visual areas you see much less. There are exceptions. Nothing is black and white, and Stan is completely uh, right in saying that there are many different opportunities for global, uh, uh, global activation in the frontal cortex. But if you talk, look at the bulk of the response, you see clearly that the front is associated with the report, while the back, the, the visual cortex, is more associated with uh, with just seeing the pictures. And the, the, the picture completely inverts if you are now looking about content. If you ask what contacts in the brain are selective to the content of the images, not to whether you are reporting or not, you see that these content selective, which are marked here in, in red and yellow, are all in the visual cortex. And very few, although there are some again, very few frontal activation that are associated with the content. But you can also get you can also get um, 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 frontal parietal activation with no, uh, with no, just by passive viewing, with no actual task performed. And this is a, this is a, a study, old study done by Fat Levy, where we simply looked at activation. I don't know; it's difficult to see, but these are faces, short videos that have faces in them. Again, trying to be ecological and short videos that have action items. So somebody cooking, somebody uh, moving um, uh, different items and so forth. And look at the activation in response to face videos compared to activation in the brain in response to action items. And this without doing any action. You just watch the movies and you see that in the, visual ca in the face case, you see the typical activation of the visual cortex and uh, face areas, but notice the activation for the action a massive flow of activation going into frontal and parietal cortex without the subject doing any action, merely watching the images. And I see uh, Udi is here, and Udi did very elegant work on this kind of phenomena. Udi is uh, just watching action items activate the entire dosal stream, including areas that Mike talked about, like uh, decision, uh, motion decisions and so forth. So there is this kind of mirroring or passive activation of frontal parietal cortex associated with the specific content of the visual images. And what another aspect flow outside of the visual cortex that we see automatically without any deliberate attempt to do any task is into memory areas like the entorhinal cortex and hippocampus. This is work done with uh, Rodrigo Quiroga and it's Huck Fried. Single unit recording in MTL structures. The subjects are just watching pictures, masked, and they are asked to recognize, just like the first experiment, whether some, some the patient saw the, the images or not. And you see automatic activation in the medial temporal lobe for seeing the faces, firing of neurons, ignition, and not seeing the face. So this again happens without any performance of conscious task or attempt to make a decision. More recently, Itzik Norman in our lab looked at a much more massive and interesting phenomena called uh, sharp wave ripples that are massive synchronous activation of large populations of neurons where, while patients were viewing uh, faces and recalling uh, images. And again, you see a very strong automatic activation just to watching the images and sort of flowing into memory with a ripple activation, uh, but only for the novel presentation of the images. And you see a re, uh, reactivation again uh, in these areas when, when the patients were trying to recall those images. So again, we see massive flow into memory areas that is done automatically without 
um, without um, uh, any plan to do a decision and so forth. So uh, the, print the last principle is frontal parietal activation is selective to content and task, and report-free visual perceptions is linked to activation flow downstream into memory-related areas. And to summarize everything I told you, the central neuronal event in our uh, sort of hands and in our studies that is actually related to conscious perception is this local ignition that is activating within a visual area and it generates a pattern or an assembly of activation uh, of a neuron. The function of this uh, ignition is of course speculative, but we assume that it is done to bind an assembly, a pattern of neurons, so they will point into a location in geometric phase space, and this is done through recurrent uh, activation of these neurons within the visual, uh, the, the visual area. The appearance of the visual uh, image is defined by the similarity to other activation patterns, and the activation flows automatically to non-visual areas, but this is done in a task-selective manner, as I showed you, and also depending on the content, and automatically it seems to be registered in memory areas. So I want to thank you for listening and to thank the people who participated, Liv Noy, Kat Norman, Kyle Golan, Shanigo Osman, Michal Arnel, and Professor Ashesh Mehta was the neurosurgeon. Thank you. Yes, Lucia. is that it's a, a, it, it entails the idea that the geometry is shared across individuals, which, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a hypothesis, right? But is it really necessary, right? I can, I can also imagine, like, if I am a synesthet, I perceive letters in a particular way that is different from you, right? So then my geometry has to be consistent with myself, but it doesn't necessarily have to be consistent with yours. And the way in which you are investigating is through consistency across individuals. Yes, it's an excellent question. We are... We, the fact that we investigated this way is due to technical limitations. We could not collect sufficient data from one patient to do the whole thing in one patient. It's completely constrained, and had we not found anything, I, you could be completely justified in saying there's a perfect distance and everything. You just didn't have, uh, you know, you didn't do it properly because people are too different from each other. Surprisingly, despite the fact that we did it between individuals, and in fact between Israelis and Americans, and between patients and health individuals, there is some canonical similarity that agreed, at least within, you know, uh, people who live in Western society and whatever, uh, about faces. Of course, we have the other race effects and all that that we should account. So basically, grossly speaking, there is canonical thing. I'm sure that had we had the power, and in fact, one, now we are trying to do it with fMRI, so we could get this data in individual, a subject, we will probably get a much more reliable and strong effect. So definitely I'm with you that it's an individual, individual people are different for many, many levels, but we find that there is a sort of a canonical aspect to this representation. Um, beautiful. Uh, the, the, the idea of similarity in, in, uh, in embedding space of, of faces, uh, as you yourself uh, demonstrated, uh, seems to be uh, suggesting that even if it forward network uh, will exhibit similar phenomena, which means that it might be simply uh, a fundamental property of networks that, uh, that um, are specialized to recognize faces. And I'm not sure why do you connect it to conscious perception? Excellent question. What's called Haramalan Khata? I don't know what you say. Um, because, because one thing I know, I believe, I mean, I'm, I think it is shared, that at least then the feed-forward networks that we now talk about, VGG and all that, are not conscious, okay? So you need to account what is the difference between uh, these networks that do beautifully face recognition and show the same similarity distances, indeed showing that this is all done feed-forward, and the fact that we are conscious and they are not conscious. So I'm asking, what is different in our brain from these networks? The distances are the same, but what is different, what's really clearly, strikingly different, is the recurrent connection. So what I'm trying to say is that the basis, it's a little bit reminiscent of this feed-forward sweep. The basis of the structure is done feed-forward, but the actual conscious aspect of it requires the recurrency. This is the hypothesis, and it seems to fit with the dynamics that you see, because you don't see in feed-forward networks this long-lasting uh, 
responses and you don't see this amplification, you just see a response. So this seems to be fitting nicely with the idea. It's a hypothesis, uh, needs further study. Unfortunately, we don't have uh, you know, optogenetic tools that could very easily uh, study it, but, or maybe in animal models. Yes. Uh, no, okay, so y you argue that the, the, the conscious percept of a face only requires these reentered connections within, say, face selective cortex. Uh, of course, we have also studied face, uh, face perception, conscious versus unconscious, and there we showed that uh, the difference between conscious and unconscious is in interaction between face selective areas and lower level areas which to me makes a bit of sense given that uh, you know, a conscious percept of a face is not just categorizing that face as being a particular face, but also you, know, you integrate this with the color of this face and the, and the shape of this face and the maybe motion of this face. So y that would require much more widespread interactions, although remaining within visual cortex, of course. Now, I noticed that you only looked at this, uh, these kinds of signals for face-selective cells. W would you expect that if you would have included, say, lower level areas, that you would also have found these kinds of re re recurrent activations, or maybe even mo maybe even spaces that would encompass also lower level visual areas? Yeah. So two questions, uh, three qu three answers. First of all, we we don't see this very lo uh, long lasting re reverberation in early visual cortex. They seem to be. Uh, more sharply responding, like in the in the in the bl in, uh, in the gap even response, you could see responses that follow the stimulus very very precisely. Secondly, our work with the with the with the blinking seems to say we don't simply find this this uh, related. We we are contrasting conscious versus conscious aspect that is completely early visual cortex, it's black and white, you know, seeing light and not seeing light, and yet we don't see any difference in early visual cortex. And thirdly, the results that you show that are very elegant, that show this continuation of signal when you are aware or not aware, could be, according to my thinking, a projection down that comes after the perceptual state that is now sort of reorienting area, uh, visual early, uh, early visual areas towards particular stimuli or whatever. So I, I'm, I'm referring this, this difference that you see in early visual cortex between seen and unseen, between gestalt and non-gestalt, to a feed back signal that is very rapid, and we found uh, these uh, signals from the ignition spread very fast all over the cortex. There is a signal that goes back that happens only when you have an ignition in high order areas and does not happen when you don't have it, and that's why you see the difference. But I understand Peter is going to show decisive um, uh, data that will argue against me, so I'm open-minded to change. Uh, maybe for very, very specific, very detailed type of conscious experience, you do need uh, I want to add another intriguing um, report among in the clinical literature that people with lesions to V1 apparently have very vivid hallucinations uh, and dreams that are actually mapped to the lesion part in the visual, lesion retinotopic part in the visual cortex. This is a sort of cortical Bonnet syndrome. And I think, again, I know it's very anecdotal and neurological and not very <laughs> carefully studied, but again, it seems that that we are able to generate a phenomenal world in the absence of the tissue or the neuron, the relevant neurons in, U, uh, in V1. So I think this suggests that the V1 is more of a conduit of information rather than some kind of an important player. Thank you for that beautiful talk. I Thank have a, a, a question about a prediction, and I want to know if you agree with it. And, and if so, if anyone's looked at this, your lab or others, if I link together the idea of the ignition with this sort of pattern of similarity space, particularly on the dimensions that you identified, is there a prediction there about sort of sequential effects on breaking into consciousness on s based on some dimensions versus others? And is, is, does that hold up? Does anyone know? I'm not sure I understand what you're saying. I'm, I'm wondering Asking. if those relevant dimensions of similarity and sort of overlap, both in sort of neuro the pattern of neural responses and the pattern of uh, the features that you've identified perceptually, is there a prediction there about how the, pre the conscious perception of one stimulus should um, uh, prime or sort of ignite the next one that should follow that pattern in particular? Excellent question. Uh, indirect evidence. We did some adaptation studies, which is a sort of priming, <coughs> in which we gradually change the faces. And it looks like that whenever the, the, this fMRI study is very indirect, we use uh, adaptation as an indirect marker for similarity of pattern. Uh, 
Uh, and it seems that whenever you're noticing that the face has changed, you get out of adaptation. It seems like really these patterns are representing some perceptual change. Whether it will be relevant to breaking into consciousness or not, interesting question, uh, and our data is very... By the way, if you invert the faces, then you need much more changes to do in order to get this separation, meaning that if for inverted faces, just like it's very difficult to see the difference between uh, inverted faces, the patterns in the brain are also much closer to other than, than, the, than you, the upright face. Stop. <coughs> Blink paradigm and ask you a question. I think it's a wonderful paradigm, and, and you know, I think you're pioneering something very important here because it's such invisible. Uh, but, but I wanted to ask you about the result. If I understand correctly, and I should read the paper carefully, but it's it's not that there is complete stability of the signals in the face of the blinks, even in anterior visual cortex, right? So you still get a disappearance. You don't get the same signal for reappearance, if I understand. Is that correct? No, no, Because no. you would expect that the conscious area related to consciousness should show perfect stability in the face of the blank. Right? We see perfect stability see for perfect the case stability. of... For the case... In other words, we, c we do not even see the trace that we are thinking of some kind of subconscious registering of the spontaneous blink. Maybe spontaneous blinks are not important enough to leave a trace. But if you look at the, at the trace, um, you don't see a hint of invisible tr uh, change. Uh, I mean, maybe this little blip, but it's completely statistically non-significant. Of course, when there is a visible gap, and that's also interesting, because FFA does not register disappearance of stimuli. It registers only the reappearance. The disappearance of stimuli is registered in dorsal stream. I didn't show the data because of lack of time, but there is a little flag in the dorsal stream telling us, hey, your face disappeared. The face selective areas don't care about disappearance. They just care about reappearance, and I think it's an interesting aspect by itself. Can you chase that elsewhere in the brain? Like, uh, Say it again? Can you chase that elsewhere in the brain? Have you, have you looked at uh, uh, Patience, uh, yeah. it's not easy. <laughs> but future generations Absolutely. I invite them. Thank you very much. Thank you.